The Allen Line Company wishes everyone a happy and prosperous 2024. Be safe out there. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. Two states are acting to significantly increase the number of truck parking spaces within their borders. Wyoming is adding spaces to one location with a history of problems, while Indiana will add spaces to rest areas across the state. We'll talk with both states' DOTs to get the details. 2024 is looking to be another big year for new regulations, and many of them do not appear favorable to truck drivers. I'll get a rundown from OOIDA Director of Federal Affairs, Jay Grimes. And finally, it's a new year, and that means fuel tax rates are changing in many states. And in many of those locations, the changes are automatic. Scott Thompson will get a rundown from our state legislative expert, Keith Goebel. But first, the news with Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. Our top story today, a new Federal Highway Administration rule on emission performance measures is set to go into effect this coming week. It requires state DOTs and metropolitan planning organizations to establish declining targets for reducing CO2 emissions generated by vehicles. The rule, which goes into effect on Monday, January 8th, does not mandate how low targets must be, instead providing some flexibility to set targets that are appropriate for individual communities, so long as the targets aim to reduce emissions over time. A coalition of 21 state attorneys general filed a lawsuit against the rule last month, arguing that the federal government does not have the authority to issue the emission performance measures. It's a new year, but the same problems in Congress, which is facing the risk of another government shutdown. You may remember that a deal was struck in the House in November that averted a shutdown leading into the holidays, but that deal is set to run out in the coming weeks. Without a new plan to fund the government by January 19th, the government will enter a partial shutdown that will affect the Department of Transportation, among others. The rest of the government would need to be funded by February 2nd. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg told Yahoo Finance this week that a shutdown would cause real problems for his department. This is not a game. This is not an exercise. This is real life. This is our actual government, the only one we've got in the United States, uh, our, our one federal government with some very important jobs to do. And frankly, the people, I mean, just thinking of the 55,000 or so men and women of this department uh, have better things to worry about all day as they look after American transportation safety uh, than worry about whether they're going to get paid in two weeks. GOP members of the House and Senate are trying to link border security to any new funding bill. But Democrats say some of the measures being touted by Republicans are a non-starter. That ups the stakes for a new deal, with House Speaker Mike Johnson declaring he's done with short-term continuing resolutions that fund the government for short periods of time. The two sides remain at odds over a top-line spending number as well. Add it all up, and pundits say the prospects of a government shutdown are very likely. What would that mean for the trucking industry? According to the DOT, trucking regulators would largely stay unaffected. That includes the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. That's because they are paid out of the Highway Trust Fund and other sources that do not depend on annual government funding. Inspections would continue, so too would other normal operations. But some trucking-related functions would be disrupted. A USDOT report detailing their plan during a shutdown includes adjustments for hazardous materials transportation providers. Only dire permits would be processed, meaning regular permits would be put on hold. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is working on a plan that would require impaired driving prevention technology on new passenger vehicles. It's part of a wider effort to get drunk and distracted drivers off the road. An advance notice of proposed rulemaking publishing Friday seeks information on developing performance requirements for the technology needed to detect impaired driving. According to NHTSA, more than 13,000 people were killed in drunk driving crashes in 2021. It's worth noting here, however, that this particular rulemaking does not apply to commercial motor vehicles. Police in Memphis are investigating yet another armed robbery that targeted a commercial truck. In a social media post, Memphis police say a FedEx truck and UPS truck were hit in separate incidents on Tuesday. In both cases, they say at least three men threatened the drivers with guns and a knife, loaded up packages into a maroon Dodge Durango, and drove off. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, but Tuesday's events follow a troubling trend in Memphis. It's causing some commercial drivers to steer clear of the city. 
Over-the-road trucker Robert Kwasniewski told WMC-TV he was a victim in Memphis recently. He says the suspect stole more than two dozen boxes off his truck. It's a shame and it's scary, but I'm not coming through Memphis no more. I'm not even going to stop. It was puts us in a bad position as truck drivers because coming from Michigan and going west, we exactly run out of time, right on the border. Right before you get to Arkansas, you're going to run out of time. In Tuesday's robberies, police have released surveillance footage, which provides a decent glimpse of the suspects. We've got a link to those images at landlinenow.com. The Utah Highway Patrol is investigating a deadly crash involving an overturned semi on Interstate 15 south of Provo. Troopers say it happened in the early morning hours of Thursday when a tractor trailer drifted off the highway and crashed when the driver overcorrected. It overturned, blocking two lanes of northbound I-15. Shortly after that, troopers say a Honda Civic traveling that same direction collided with the trailer. The driver and a passenger in the front seat were killed. Another passenger in the back seat was also hurt, last listed in critical condition. The driver of the truck suffered minor injuries but was not hospitalized. I-15 was shut down for a time overnight, but has since reopened. The crash is under investigation. The American Transportation Research Institute needs your feedback for a new survey. It aims to better understand the barriers that keep women from becoming truck drivers and staying in the profession. The topic was circled as a top priority by Atri's Research Advisory Committee as a means of addressing safety concerns and identifying steps the industry can take to increase the percentage of female drivers. This new survey is just the latest in a series dedicated to the issue of women in trucking. In the fall, Atri opened up another survey to identify what motor carriers are doing to recruit and retain female truck drivers. Atri research analyst Abigail Huffman told us at the time that more research on the issue is needed because, quite frankly, there hasn't been a whole lot of focus on it historically. Um, just for the longest time, it's it's been a men dom- male-dominated industry, and we have some research that show that women are actually safer than men on the road. Our crash predictor found that in all statistically significant categories, women are safer than men. So despite them being safer, men still dominate. And we have organizations like Women in Trucking, um, Real Women in Trucking, advisory boards with different associations aiming to really amplify the voices of women. And so obviously this is an issue and this research is kind of doing a similar thing. For the Institute's new survey, Atri is asking for input from both female and male truck drivers of all experience levels, which will help researchers pinpoint the unique challenges facing women in the industry. For more information or to take part, check out truckingresearch.org. The survey will remain open through February 2nd. And finally, a story from the world of gaming where a 13-year-old boy just did what many thought was impossible. He beat Tetris. Willis Gibson is believed to be the first human to ever beat the nearly 35-year-old game by reaching its so-called kill screen, the point at which the game crashes because the software can't go any further. The Oklahoma teen posted a video to YouTube showing the moment it happened. Yes! Oh my god! Oh my god! I'm gonna pass out! Congrats to Gibson, who used a technique called rolling, which allows the player to hit the directional pad more than 20 times a second. That's Lane Line Now News for today. I'm Scott Thompson. Thanks, Scott. If someone tries to coerce you into violating the regulations, call 1-888-DOT-SAFT or file a complaint online to the National Consumer Complaint Database. Next, we'll talk with two states' DOTs about efforts to increase the number of truck parking spaces, and I'll get a rundown of regulations we expect in 2024 from OOIDA Director of Federal Affairs, Jay Grimes. We'll be back in just a moment. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Are you tired of the IRS following you around like a dark cloud? Call 888-557-4020 and get your life back. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. 
It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Wyoming will see hundreds of additional truck parking spaces under a plan by the state's Department of Transportation. You're listening to Landline Now, and I'm your host, Mark Redding. Welcome back to the program. Jordan Young is the Deputy Public Affairs Officer at the Wyoming DOT. She spoke with me about the plan and what's involved. I wonder if you can just tell me broadly about this grant the Wyoming Department of Transportation has received to build truck parking in Evanston. Yeah, um, so we did um, receive a grant from the Federal Rural Surface Transportation Grant for about $26.6 million to build uh, just over 365 uh, semi-truck parking spaces uh, along Interstate 80, uh, just east of Evanston. Uh, So right there kind of by the Utah border. Um, It's a common place to see a lot of uh, trucks uh, waiting for winter road closures to uh, reopen, as well as just, you know, providing truck parking for hours of service requirements and those other kind of rest requirements to make sure that um, drivers have a safe place to, to meet those requirements. Will the state be matching any of that money, or is this strictly working off the federal investment? Um, yes, we do have a, a match. So the total project cost is approximately $33.3 million. So that would be the grant plus the match. Okay. What sort of services will be available at the parking area? I mean, are they going to be like restrooms or is this just parking? Um, it's just parking. It's it's along the right-of-way, kind of parallel to the right-of-way, so there's not a ton of room uh, to add additional amenities. But um, the Uinta County Senior um, this, sorry, I'm trying to make sure I get the... Oh, yeah, the U- Uinta County Senior Citizens Board uh, receives federal transit funding for that area to help with transit in the city of Evanston. Um, and so they've also uh, um, volunteered to help transport truck drivers during major storm events when there's a prolonged closure of I-80. Um, they're going to use those uh Resource, you know, transit resources that they already have in place to help get those truck drivers to amenities um, a little closer into town. So um, we do have kind of a a mechanism in place for those long duration closures. Okay. Do you have some idea of what this is going to look like? Uh, are we too far in advance to tell at this point? I do know that it's all within our right of way, so um, we do expect a lot of it to be kind of parallel parking along the highway. Um, we have a few other truck parking areas kind of similar looking along I 80. Um, and the majority of the parking spaces will be for the, the, the trucks going eastbound since, um, you know, they're right there at the Utah border. A lot of those trucks heading west can just continue on to Utah um, during those long closure events. Um, there is some parking on the westbound side uh, to handle overflow from the eastbound and for, you know, those hours of service folks uh, or for folks, you know, heading west to meet their hours of service. But the majority of the parking spaces will be for the eastbound drivers. What's the timeline for getting this up and running? Right now we think... Uh, Construction can is expected to begin in about spring 2026, depending on how long it takes for design. And then, you know, the project letting schedule, we can't do a lot of that kind of work in the winter. <laughs> we try to do what we can, but with our winters being as harsh as they are, a lot of construction activity takes place in the, in the summer. So that timing sometimes impacts what year it starts as well. But um, we're hoping to get it uh, started here soon. Does the Wyoming DOT see this as an end goal, or do you anticipate other projects to add more truck parking in the state? You know, this one we worked really closely with the local government um, agencies in Uinta County as well as in Evanston. So um, it was a very collaborative effort to respond to um, issues during those um, long duration closures on I 80 um, specific to that community. Um, but we are always looking at adding safe places for trucks to park. We just wrapped up a truck parking project uh, between Rollins and Laramie that also added, um, I believe, almost 200 spaces. So, um, you know, we're all kind of continuing to look at safe places for parking. Uh, I can't, I can't 
I think of in another specific project we have on the pipeline besides this one, but it is something we keep in mind, especially with I-80 being such a heavy freight corridor through the nation. What's the overall picture as far as truck parking this state? I think, you know, like I said, we're always looking at um, ways we can make it safer for freight drivers through our state. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to specific goals or um, where we're at on you know, how many spaces we have in the whole state. I would have to do some digging on that. Um, but, you know, looking at our 511 map, we do have a layer that shows truck parking um, along our interstates. And we do have quite a few options, you know, in each, between towns and then along in the towns. So, um, you know, we do try to um, help folks find those safe places to park, especially with our winners being as notorious as they are. But, um I think it is something we continue to look at and continue to strive for increased safety along our interstates. Um, this is over on the western end of the state, as I understand it. Um, are you looking at a similar project on the eastern side for trucks coming that direction? You know, in Cheyenne, we are seeing some increased interest in uh, truck stops, you know, more private industry route. Um, so I, I definitely think, you know, we work with uh, those businesses on access and things like that to the rights away. Um, but I don't know of any, you know, federal funding or grant funding that's being used over there at this time. But, you know, we typically don't see the um, overflow uh, in Cheyenne, Cheyenne can handle a lot more uh, traffic with its larger size and population than Evanston. And then there's also I-25 to help funnel folks down um, or up, depending on where they're headed, to, to try to alleviate some of that pack up, back up. Um, but compared to Evanston, you know, where that's kind of where you enter the state and there's not a lot of alternative routes away from Evanston, you, you do see a lot more uh trucks parking over there. So, uh, like I said, we were kind of working with the, the local government over there to to alleviate an issue that they were seeing uh, on the ground during those long-term closures for winter storms. We had a lot of local and, um, you know, state support for the project, so we're really thrilled that uh, we were awarded the grant. It is our third federal grant in a year uh, that we were awarded, not specific. I mean, the other grants aren't specific to commercial vehicles, but um, it is exciting to see that the federal government is um, working with us to, you know, uh, accomplish some of these projects and goals that we've been ha that we've had. So, definitely want to give uh, the FHWA and USDOT a shout out as well for their, um, that, you know, them recognizing that this was a needed project. Jordan Young, the Deputy Public Affairs Officer at the Wyoming Department of Transportation. Indiana is going a step further than Wyoming, a big step, with a near doubling of available rest area parking across the entire state under a new plan. Natalie Garrett is the Strategic Communications Director of the Indiana Department of Transportation. She spoke with me about that plan, including the specifics on truck parking and other improvements. I wanted to ask about the state DOT's plan to create more truck parking. Um, first of all, how much parking are we talking about and where would it be? Yeah, um, so I'll kind of give just a general overview to start. So the truck parking expansion is part of NDOT's 10-year plan to improve um, rest areas and welcome centers across the state. Um, so... We're looking at adding more than 1,200 additional um, semi-trailer parking spaces, and those, that will occur um, at various locations across the state. Um, some of these locations um, are welcome centers, and they're being completely redone um, with additional truck parking. Um, we're also doing some conversions of existing rest areas to own truck parking only locations. Um, so the, you know, your typical rest area amenities um, will be removed. Um, it will be only truck parking. Um, there will be um, a restroom facility available, um, but we're looking at more than 1,200 additional parking spaces. That's nearly double um, what we have now existing um, across the state. 
You mentioned the two rest areas to be converted into truck parking, uh, and you mentioned that there would be restrooms. Would there be any other facilities available at those locations? Um, at the truck parking um, conversion location, um, it would just be um, restroom facilities. I believe um, seven individual um, restrooms um, there would be would be available at those locations. Okay. Uh, you mentioned in addition to creating more truck parking, that this is going to modernize the existing rest areas. I'm wondering if you can kind of give us some detail in terms of what other sorts of improvements will be made as part of this plan to those rest areas. Yeah. Um, so construction of new buildings um, is, is part of that. Um, we have a couple that are under construction currently and one that just opened up in northwest Indiana this fall. Um, the Kankakee Welcome Center on I-65 southbound. Um, so new buildings, uh, improved parking facilities, um, a number of amenities um, will be added. Um, an aspect of the plan is to create a destination of sorts for travelers, um, travelers of all kinds, um, you know, to provide a safe, relaxing environment for those drivers to rest and recharge. Um, these improved welcome centers um, include walking paths, dog parks, um, recreation areas, some interactive, informative exhibits, um, and as well as some commissioned art. Um, I'm curious, how much does the DOT estimate this will cost, and how is the state going to pay for that cost? We're investing more than $600 million across, um, I think it's around 20, 21 locations um, across the state, and this is federal funding you know, that we're receiving for these improvements. Okay. What spurred the state to consider this plan? Um, so we knew that our existing um, network of rest areas and welcome centers um, needed to be modernized. Um, NDOT receives um, a number of customer um, concerns um, regarding our rest areas and welcome centers each year. Um, so this plan is a way for us to address these needs and concerns um, as well as provide um, a safer, more modernized um, locations for people um, to stop, rest, recharge while traveling. We're, we also have heard from the, um, the trucking industry um, that there's a need for additional truck parking. We're aware of that. Um, so this is a way that we can help address that issue as well. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit. The uh, We know there's a national truck parking shortage, and uh, you mentioned that uh, the industry there in Indiana indicated that there was a need for more truck parking. Um, what is the current state of truck parking, and how far would this plan go towards solving the shortage in your state? Yeah, I don't have those numbers in front of me, the industry numbers in general, but NDOT believes that this is a, a first step, if you will, in you know, addressing that shortage and providing more options and, you know, more truck parking for the industry across the state. Okay. Do you have a timeline for completion of the additional truck parking and other improvements? Um, so all 21 locations are expected to be complete by the end of fiscal year 2034. Um, the document that I sent over to you yesterday outlines kind of location by location um, you know, what that timeline currently looks like. Excellent. Natalie, thank you very much for your time. No problem. That was Natalie Garrett, Strategic Communications Director of the Indiana Department of Transportation, talking about a plan to significantly increase truck parking in the state. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Attention professional drivers, are you behind on your tax filings? You owe money? Integrity Tax Relief Group frees drivers from IRS trouble. You watch the road, we'll keep an eye on the IRS. Call now, 855-976-4291. Dispatch, I picked up that load of steel, so I'm ready to roll. Sounds good. Remember, we're getting paid by weight, so make sure to use a cat scale. <laughs> I wouldn't weigh anywhere else. For cat miss accuracy, when you check on a cat scale. Mm-hmm. 
It's a new year now. What sort of new regulations might you face in 2024? Welcome back to Landline Now. This is Regulatory Roundup, and I'm Mark Reddick. I'm joined, as always, by OOIDA Director of Federal Affairs, Jay Grimes. Jay, how are you doing? Doing well, Mark. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. A lot of issues we're expecting to come up, and, and the first one is something we expected to come up already, which is speed limiters. Yeah, that's right. And this is going to be uh, a, a critical regulatory issue that, uh, you know, we're awaiting potential action on. We have been throughout 2023, uh, and we'll kind of continue to keep our eye out uh, in 2024. And uh, this really goes back to, I think, spring of 2022 and sort of out of the blue, FMCSA kind of reopened. Uh, the speed limiter rulemaking process. There were 15,000 comments filed, and we've kind of, uh, you know, unfortunately been awaiting FMCSA's uh, next phase of the rulemaking process, which would be a a notice of proposed rulemaking, and we heard a couple times that that would come out uh, sometime in 2023. That certainly uh, has not happened yet, and we're kind of still waiting on some um, regulatory steps that FMCSA kind of has to undertake. Uh, They've got to submit the notice to the Office of Management and Budget um, for review. That has not taken place yet. And then at that point, once the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, completes their review, then FMCSA would then put out the notice for public comment. So kind of uh, still wait and see uh, on when FMCSA is kind of going to get this out. Um, you know, by all our kind of understanding, it is FMCSA's goal to, to kind of move forward with this rulemaking. Obviously, we are uh, in opposition to FMCSA advancing in any speed limiter mandate. Uh, we've uh, championed uh, legislation that would prevent FMCSA from moving forward. That legislation continues to gain uh, support. But as we kind of start the new year, kind of still <laughs> still waiting on the next regulatory step. Now, this has been a battle not only between pros and cons, but also different groups pushing for different versions of a speed limiter regulation. Um, The safety groups have taken a very particular position here. What are they pushing for? Yeah, so uh, since 2006, when ATA and some speed limiter groups first petitioned uh, DOT for speed limiter rulemaking, there have been some... Certainly a change uh, of perspectives over the years. Kind of the the latest uh, perspectives are, you know, safety advocates want to see a a speed limiter rulemaking at a kind of a strict 60 mile an hour setting. Uh, ATA, some of the other larger carrier groups kind of want to see more of an an adaptive speed limiter technology rulemaking, um, perhaps set at 65. But if you have certain technology on your trucks... You can go up to as high as 70. Um, There were some initial reports last year that FMCSA kind of retracted that that 68 would be that that firm setting. And we've seen the agency kind of consider 60, 65, and 68 uh, back in a previous uh, proposed rulemaking. But nothing's been set. uh, Nothing's been proposed as of now. So that'll be kind of one thing to watch if FMCSA, if and when they come out with this proposal, uh, if they indicate a a specific speed limiter setting. Um, You mentioned the the huge response uh, by truckers and others to the advance notice of proposed rulemaking a couple of years ago. Based on what we read in those comments, what are the chief concerns that truckers have with the idea of speed limiters? Yeah, uh, significant uh, safety and and operational uh, concerns. And you hear a number of different uh, problems that that truckers kind of envision. I think first and foremost is the speed differential that would be created uh, between commercial motor vehicles that can only go 60, 65, 70, and then uh, other vehicles on the road, which some states, you've got speed limits as, as high as 80 miles an hour. And when you look at some studies that have been done, uh, those speed differentials can create sometimes over 200 percent higher chance uh, of crashes. So some real safety concerns there. 
taking uh, the ability to avoid a crash uh, and avoid collisions if you need to speed up, if you're going, uh, you know, the maximum speed limiter uh, uh, settings on the highways as well, uh, different uh, environmental and, and fuel efficiency uh, concerns too when it comes to, to speed limiters. And then I think what we see oftentimes right now on trucks that are speed limited is you get two trucks going down the highway at uh, lower than the average speed, uh, get the uh, backup, the elephant races, and that creates a lot of road rage for drivers trying to weave in and out of trucks, speed up and, and try and pass the trucks. And, and again, that's going to be very unsafe as well. Um, very quickly, I'm wondering, you mentioned the uh, legislation out there that would block this, and there's a couple of different efforts uh, going on, I know, in a spending bill and also in a separate bill. Can you just briefly go over those? Yeah, so we've got two standalone bills uh, that have been introduced in the House and the Senate, uh, the Drive Act, which would prevent FMCSA from moving forward. Uh, same uh, legislative language that is uh, included uh, among many policy provisions in the annual transportation appropriations bill. Uh, that bill has been pa uh, passed by the House Appropriations Committee. Uh, a different version has been passed uh, by the Senate. The House is still working on their version, which is um, set to expire here in a couple weeks. So going to be interesting to see what version uh, of that House appropriations bill uh, is enacted. We're hoping that their bill will, will include this provision that prevents FMCSA from moving forward. Um, and then we'll kind of see if that gets uh, correlated with the, 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 the Senate version of the bill. So some legislative steps on the appropriation front that are still going to have to get worked out here in the next couple of weeks. Another issue we're looking to come out in the new year um, is rules for automated driving systems. And, and right now, Jay... Are there rules in place guiding development and deployment of this technology? Yeah, not not so much. Uh, there are some guidelines that DOT ha has put out. There are some reporting requirements if a commercial motor vehicle is involved in a crash, but really there's there's not a whole lot of oversight when it comes to federal land and uh, you know, FMCSA, NHTSA, some of the other agencies have been, you know, putting out some different proposals, trying to figure out what regulations would need to be amended or adapted um, for the development uh, of these autonomous vehicles. And FMCSA put out a couple different versions of uh, kind of the initial phase of the rulemaking process, advanced notice of proposed rulemakings, kind of trying to gather information, trying to identify which federal motor carrier safety regulations would need to be changed, removed, uh, or adapted to to kind of move these uh, this technology along. And uh, at the end of last year, um, FMCSA did send their notice of proposed rulemaking over to OMB. So this one is moving a little uh, further along uh, than the speed limiter uh, proposal. So probably going to see sometime uh, spring, maybe mid-year, this kind of next version of what FMCSA is going to try to uh, accommodate for when it comes to automated driving systems. But still so many questions, still a lot of hypothetical uh, attempts to to kind of edit the the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulation. So it's going to be really interesting to see what FMCSA includes in the next next step of the the rulemaking process, which does seem like it's going to come out sometime here in the first half of 2024. Um, next issue up is automatic emergency braking systems, and this is something that involves the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the FMCSA together. Um, I guess we're looking at a final rule in 2024. Wasn't this mandated in legislation? Yeah, this goes back to the uh, the 2021 uh, Highway Bill, the Infrastructure Investment of Jobs Act, that um, mandated that that NHTSA and FMCSA uh, undergo a rulemaking process to mandate automatic emergency braking systems, not only on commercial vehicles, but also a separate rulemaking process for all other uh, vehicles on the road. And, and last year, we saw those uh, proposed rulemakings be released. And when it came to the the heavy-duty vehicle one, we had a lot of problems um, with the way the testing was going to uh, be set up and established, that we didn't really think it was going to hit 
all the benchmarks to make sure that whenever the mandate uh, is going to go into effect, that it would really crack down and eliminate these false false activation alerts that we see on, on, on trucks right now that are equipped with AEB standards. Um, so kind of going back to kind of the target dates here, uh, we've seen projected dates by the end of April. Uh, NHTSA and FMCSA are going to come out with that final rulemaking. Uh, again, this is going to be one they have to submit to, to the Office of Management and Budget that has not taken place yet. I think there's a little more wiggle room in, in terms of if, if they are delayed, kind of considering some of the problems that uh, I think a lot of drivers weighed in in, in, the, in the public comment period uh, that was open uh, last year. So April 30th is kind of the, the soft date that uh, NHTSA has put out right now. Uh, it, when you look back at the proposal, depending on the the size of the manufacturer, kind of gave a three to five year window once the final rulemaking was out for the mandate to go into effect. We'll see if any of that changes, if and when that final rulemaking uh, is issued, potentially by the end of April. But I kind of expect this one could get pushed back a little bit, kind of given the concerns uh, that we saw during the public comment period. What were the comments like on the proposed rulemaking? Yeah, a lot of concerns with drivers who have had experience with AEBs on the false activations saying really makes it unsafe when the when these systems uh, kind of go off without warning when there is not uh, an impending danger at all. Uh, again, taking control out of the driver's hand. So we really want to make sure that the testing over this implementation window before the mandate goes into effect – uh, can kind of clear up uh, those false activation problems. Um, another thing we did was kind of unclear uh, before the rulemaking came out was this idea of retrofit. I think we did support uh, in the proposal there's not going to be uh, an existing uh, – a retrofit to require existing heavy vehicles – uh, to be equipped with AEB, but only be on, on new vehicles moving forward whenever that mandate uh, timeline uh, kind of gets clarified. But still so many concerns. There's a, We had a lot of problems that NHTSA put out this proposal without doing proper consultation with drivers who have had experience with AEB. So we want to see some more of that be completed uh, before the final rule is published as well. I want to skip ahead in the minute or so we have left here, Jay, to the topic of broker transparency, which FMCSA has on its agenda. We've been waiting a little while for this one, haven't we? Yeah, no doubt. Uh, really going back to a petition that we filed uh, in May of 2020 to improve broker transparency. Um, sort of that petition went through a number of public comment periods, but – you know, back in March of, of last year, we heard FMCSA was going to uh, move forward with the rulemaking process to improve broker transparency regulations. When they first came out with that announcement, uh, we were happy to hear it, thought that there was going to be some movement on it uh, sometime last year, but then kind of in the most recent unified regulatory agenda, which came out in early December, we heard uh, not going to be out until the end of October 2024, which we think is little bit too slow, given everything that's transpired with broker fraud and broker transparency. So hopeful that FMCSA will get that out, hopefully sooner than October, but they need to move forward on as soon as possible. Okay. Well, Jay, we've run out of time, but thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I've been talking with OOIDA Director of Federal Affairs, Jay Grimes. Landline Now will be back in a moment. Stock up on Howe's Diesel Treat, the nation's most trusted anti-gel. And to be safe from the harshest winter conditions, make sure you have Howe's Diesel Lifeline on hand, the fastest-acting gelling rescue product. Available nationwide, Howe's products are designed to keep you rolling through the toughest conditions. Visit Howe'sProducts.com. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com. Because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. 
And we're back with just enough time to take a quick trip to a few states making moves with regard to trucking issues in the new year. Welcome to our weekly state legislative update as we welcome in Keith Goble of Landline Magazine. Keith, good to see you. Scott, happy new year. Happy new year to you as well, Keith. Good to see you as well. Uh, a new year often means new fuel tax rates for many states. We've got a few to run through here, Keith. Doesn't look like we have any drastic changes really to talk about, but those cents do add up, as we all know. Uh, we've got a healthy mix here of increases and decreases here. Uh, yeah, you know, from year to year, um, you're by and large just going to see, for the most part, increases. Um, and then they can be you know, small amounts, and there are a handful of states that have uh, what I, what you know, myself or uh, a lot of folks might consider to be minor changes, like a penny or less, and um, and then we see that on an annual basis. Uh, you know, J- January first and July first each year really are the the main dates where states implement uh, fuel tax rate changes, as a lot of folks are familiar. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, and there are, in addition to the states that just have uh, the minimal uh, changes, uh, there are those that will have maybe some more significant changes. Um, I think for the start of 2024, I five cents it might be about the the ceiling on on a rate change as far as as far as these states go but but yeah um uh, obviously nevertheless um noteworthy any type of change in fuel tax rates um, no matter the amount yeah and we can run through a, a few of the changes here and, and i suppose we'll start with michigan where it looks like prices are going up uh looks like by more than a cent there yeah and really these are all of these changes that are taking effect, um, these were planned increases, uh, whether they are automatic adjustments or uh, that have been in effect for years in a lot of instances, or uh, you know maybe a state uh, introduced a, a new law and, and or had a bill signed into law that authorizes a, a tax rate increase that was scheduled to take effect on January 1st. Uh, in Michigan, um, here for, gosh, this is now now two years, uh, that a law uh, has been in place that links their fuel taxes to the Consumer Price Index. Uh, as a result, for 2024, uh, the tax rate for, for gas and diesel, both up about a penny and a half, uh, so about it's like 30 cents for both gas and diesel, those tax rates. Uh, so a minimum increase, I guess you might consider it. Uh, but yeah, it is an annual annual deal in Michigan now for the second year in a row. And Oregon, the rate's going up by even more there, uh, January 1st. Yeah, for both gas and diesel. Uh, now, worth you know, obviously mentioning you know, the diesel tax that's applied for uh, vehicles uh, below 26,000 pounds. Uh, fuel rates went up by two cents, so they're, they're 40 cents for both gas and diesel. Now, for you know those diesel uh, fueled vehicles in excess of 26,000 pounds, the weight miles, uh, excuse me, the, the miles tax rate, the vehicle miles tax rate uh, up a bit for 2024 as well. So uh, again, yes, uh, an increase uh, not only Michigan, but Oregon too. So no celebrations in Michigan or Oregon with regard to the fuel tax rate, but we uh, should talk about Pennsylvania and West Virginia, where in both states, in both cases, the rates are going down. Yeah, Pennsylvania, uh, I'd say the most notable just because of how expensive uh, the gas tax and the diesel tax are uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, for for gas, uh, the tax rate's down about three and a half cents. So we're down in there on the 57 and a half cent rate for for the gas tax in Pennsylvania for diesel, which is significantly higher uh, there in Pennsylvania. Uh, the rate is down by about four and a half cents. So it's you know like seventy four cents per gallon there for 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 diesel uh, in Pennsylvania. But um, as as folks who who travel through Pennsylvania uh, well aware um, at their rate, uh, I'm trying to think if there is a state that has a higher tax rate at the top of my head. But yeah, yeah. a very very notable uh, amount uh, that that folks continue to have to pay there. And West Virginia, same story there. Yeah, um, you know, the, a lower rate. It's about what it has been, you know, in the low 37 cent range. Um, 
but for both uh, gas and diesel for 2024, rates down about a penny and a half. So it's in the neighborhood of 35 and a half cents there. And it will be uh, for the remainder of the year until, you know, we get to the start of 2025 when there will be uh, another adjustment. You know, Virginia, excuse me, West Virginia has a, a variable rate and a fixed rate. So obviously the fixed rate is fixed. It doesn't, doesn't get changed annually, but that variable rate – uh, is the one that is affected and as a result um, for the benefit of truckers and consumers and travelers out there, uh, it's down, down slightly. Yeah, and as you mentioned that too, uh, we should mention, I guess about half of the states, right, do have a variable rate that could change each year. It could change over the course of this coming year, right? They kind of depends on the state, but the, the changes are not set in stone for many of these states. Yeah. You know, there's, uh, as you said, about half the states. Uh, yeah, we're get, getting ever so closer to half. Uh, right now, 23 states that have variable rate uh, state fuel taxes. Um, gosh, you go back 20 years. Um, I don't even know. There, 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 was, there was less than a handful, I think it's fair to say. But uh, through the years, as state lawmakers have attempted to make adjustments, um, doing it, uh, essentially indexing, uh, in having these variable rates take effect, that they don't have to revisit the issue. More and more states have, have taken advantage of that. Now you've got, what, 10 states that have have uh, their tax rates, uh, they're based on inflation, allowing for um, uh, annual adjustments. Um, got about a half dozen states that tie their uh, their, their prices to the, the wholesale price. Uh, and then about another half dozen states that have a combination of factors uh, that they link their their rates to. So um, uh, various ways that states, I mean, I'd say they've been creative with uh, allowing to have their fuel rates modified on an annual basis. Speaking of fuel taxes, and we've only got a couple minutes here, but let's talk about Missouri a little bit. Uh, fuel taxes is a topic that's come up many times over recent years there. Uh, and here we are again with some lawmakers calling for even more changes just a few years, really, after a tax rate hike in the Show Me State took effect. Yeah, yeah again, uh, talking about uh, state lawmakers needing to be creative to get a fuel tax increase through um, Missouri back in 2021, following in the footsteps of South Carolina. Um, implemented a fuel tax rate increase uh, for both gas and diesel uh, purchases. It's the same rate for gas and diesel. It had been $0.17 cents, um, per gallon. Uh, but, yeah, it's what is now a uh, nearly a three-year-old law uh, authorized the, the taxes to be increased by about $0.12.5 cents over the course of five years. $0.02.5 cent increases essentially annually um, until it reaches that $0.29.5 cent mark. Uh, like South Carolina, Missouri has um, a rebate option essentially for residents, um, residents who don't drive large trucks. Uh, and that is one of the things that, you know, there's a lawmaker uh, in Missouri, a senator who is, has been trying to make um, changes to what the state, uh, what, what they do as far as fuel tax collection and uh, the rebate options. Like, uh, one bill would um, remove the weight limitation that limits eligible refunds to essentially passenger vehicles only. It would apply it to Missouri-based truck operations, so they could they would be able to take advantage of that uh, refund offering. But that that's not the only bill that a particular lawmaker, Senator Mike Moon, has offered now for at least a, a couple of sessions now. I mean, there's another one that would uh, change how folks um, apply for their refunds, uh, allowing them not, not that they would have to do it annually. They could do it uh, via an app is one of the things that he's offered up. Uh, but in addition to that, um, <laughs> just to make some sort of modification to the uh, state fuel tax collection. He's also offered a bill that would just simply repeal mm -hmm. uh, the, the fuel tax rate increases so it would turn uh, the tax rates to where they were prior to um, the summer of 2021, so they would be 17 cents. I don't think that that's likely, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of things on the offer in there in Missouri. Time will tell. Keith, pleasure as always. We'll okay. see you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. You can check out Keith's work at Landline.media and in every issue of Landline Magazine. That's our time for today. We appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. 
photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And And together, together we we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the owner-operator independent drivers association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com. 